I don't know about you, but life uh, can seem to be filled with all sorts of ups and downs, uh, unexpected uh, and unforeseen challenges. But what if we could see life through a different filter? What if we could navigate and reframe our mindset and discover how God has purpose in whatever comes our way? Now, if you've got a phone, do you ever use your phone and, and take those pictures uh, and, and, and you're like, ah, it's not a really good picture. But then you go to the filters and, and you put a cool filter on it and all of a sudden it's like, man, now it's amazing. It's not real. It's kind of fake, but it's amazing now, right? Or have you ever taken a picture and you're like, all right, I got to go, wait, I actually don't need a filter on this. This came out really good. Anybody, anybody do that with their phones? No, nobody. Okay, one of us, two, three. Thank you. Um, we, we see the image, but whether it's not good enough or we throw a filter over it to change the perspective, to brighten it, to soften it, to change the color tone of it. And what if we could reframe our perspective, use a different filter in which we saw our circumstances and the unforeseen challenges that come our way? Last week, across all of our campuses, we started this new series going through the book of Philippians to help us do just that, to let Jesus help reframe and reshape the way we see our lives and the world around us, to allow Jesus to become the filter or the lens through which we see life. And today, we're going to be in the second half of chapter one. This is the second half of really Paul's introduction in his letter as he encourages the early church in Philippi that, that through Jesus we can reframe the way we see the world and understand our struggles can be used by God. And often, for us to reframe our perspective, for us to shift and, and see through a different lens, it requires that we first move our gaze and our focus from what's right in front of us and our circumstances and look up and look towards God to reframe our focus. And that's where this little toy comes in. Y'all remember this thing? You ever grow up with one of these? Um, yeah, one of my, uh, all I remember really growing up with this toy is how frustrating it is for a toddler. And, uh, right, because you take, you, you take an object, you take a square, and, and you just, you're like, I want it to go right here. And as a toddler, you don't even think about all these other spots. You're just like, no, I want it to go here. I want it to go in this one. And, and what you end up finding out is that toddlers, they, they just start getting louder and louder. And you're like, why did I buy that stinking toy? It's so annoying. All it's doing is making all this noise. Oh, look, one came out. Goes right there. And, and what we end up doing, see, I... I don't like this toy because of the anxiety and stress that it gives a three-year-old. I like this toy because it reminds me of the millions and millions of people who are equally as frustrated with life and the struggles they face. What we're looking at when it comes to how to reframe the struggles of our life that so often I try to take what I want and how I want it and fit where I want it to go. But that's not how God intended life. And often my struggles and my frustrations, uh, what, what do I do with that? Well, God wants us to reframe our perspective a little bit. Our big idea this morning is this, reframing my struggles through God's perspective allows me to live with a purpose greater than myself. And this is what we're going to unpack this morning, that when I allow, uh, when I reframe my struggles through God's perspective, through a, a different lens, it allows me to live with greater purpose for my life. And this is why we do what we do here at Heritage Church. Because there is a hole in all of our hearts. And that we try to fill it with all sorts of things. Many people trying to cram square pegs into round holes. And there was a guy in the Bible named Solomon he was the richest man who had ever lived, the wisest man who had ever lived. He would, he, I mean, he makes Bill Gates and Elon Musk look like you and me. I mean, he had all that you could ever want. And in his journal, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, he says it like this, and I'm paraphrasing, but he, but he says, I said to myself, I told my heart, come now, let, let's just see what I can fill up this hole in my heart with. 
what in this world, what pleasure will satisfy me? He puts it this way. He says, I tried everything under the sun to see what would fill that hole. And he had the resources to do it too. I mean, he had all the money. He had the real estate, the mansions, the palaces, gardens, parks, and reservoirs. He had music and sexual encounters and the best food and the best wine and the best parties. And you know what he discovered? He says it's all meaningless. It didn't work. I tried everything. I mean, I tried this and I tried that, and I, but nothing would fill, nothing would satisfy. It was like chasing after the wind trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. What he discovered is the fact that deep within every human heart is a God-shaped hole. Every heart, every person is longing to fill this hole, this void within ourselves with something transcendent, with something eternal. It's why humanity has always been fascinated with the fountain of youth or living longer. Solomon goes on in his journal in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and he explains it this way. He says it like this. He says, God has made everything. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Do we have that passage? Also, God has put eternity into man's heart. God has made everything beautiful, but he's also put eternity into man's heart. Did you know that you are an eternal being? You will live forever. The only question is, is where you will live forever, in heaven with Jesus or in hell, separated from him. He has placed eternity into man's heart, but yet so that We cannot understand, we cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. You may be an eternal being, but you are not an all-knowing being. And that God-shaped hole in all of us cannot be filled with earthly shapes. He has placed eternity into us. Now now you say, why are we talking about all this? I thought we were looking at Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Why are we looking at Ecclesiastes? Here's why. This is what Paul is talking about in the second half of Philippians. This is what he begins to address, speaking directly to the identity struggles that we wrestle with, searching for purpose and significance for meaning in life. And so many of us will struggle trying to fill the emptiness that's deep inside of us with the affection and care of other people. We see this maybe more than anything else, is our desire to be accepted, our desire to be loved, try to fill that emptiness so we get married thinking that'll fill it but it doesn't work and so we think oh we'll have kids that'll do it but that can't fulfill us either and like Solomon we try everything under the sun to fill the longing of our hearts with something greater than ourselves and we keep searching and we keep searching we try power we try accomplishments we try substances we try sexual encounters sexual identity shifts relationships of all kind we try work and money adventure and travel you name it humanity has tried it all in a search to att- in an attempt to fill that missing place there is there is a movie it's it's kind of older now but i think i think a lot of us have seen it uh, the movie jerry maguire right do you remember the, the famous lines from Jerry Maguire? you remember? Yeah, if you're a guy and you saw that movie, I saw some of you starting to mouth it. Show me the money, right? But if, you're a, but if you're a lady and you saw that movie, you're like, no, 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 no. The best line of that movie was towards the end when, when he comes in and, and Tom Cruise says to Renee Zellweger, you complete me. You complete me. This is what we try to do with our lives. This is what we're searching for, someone to complete me. Someone to fill that hole, that gap. But all that perspective can do is set that relationship up for failure. We spend our lives trying to cram the square peg of relationships with imperfect people into the round hole of our heart. And if you do that long enough, somewhere along the line, you'll you'll realize, you'll experience that really, really hurts. Haven't you experienced the hurt of someone you loved? 
Haven't you found people will hurt you? Even as healthy as, and good as a relationship can be, no relationship possesses the ability to complete me. People will betray you. People will break promises. They will break vows. They will exclude you and reject you, wound you, and disappoint you, abuse you. And when you're stung by somebody, when you get hurt by someone that, was a, that you expected to complete you, all the acceptance, all the security, all of the significance that you are counting and craving is gone. Paul is going to show us only Jesus can fill the God-shaped hole that all of us have and long to fill. So Philippians chapter 1, if you've got your Bible, you can turn there. It's, uh, it's kind of right here. If you're not used to navigating your Bible, you might just start at the end and flip the other way. and You'll, you'll get there faster. Philippians chapter 1, Paul, it's, it's been about 10 years since he launched this church. Acts chapter 16, maybe you just even want to jot that down at the top of uh, chapter 1. Acts chapter 16 tells us of the first time Paul was in Philippi and and the demon-possessed girl that that he heals and, and the... And then everybody's like chasing him around, trying to run him out of town. He gets put in prison. He meets a jailer. You know, his whole family gets transformed. Uh, he he meets this girl named Lydia who's uh, an entrepreneur, and she knows God, but she doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, and, and on and on. And, and, and it tells us the background to the story. We're about 10 years removed from that journey. Paul is now in prison in Rome writing to this church that's now flourishing, and he's kind of giving them an update. Hey, you heard I'm in prison. It's true. I'm in prison. Thank you so much for your generous support for me while I'm in prison. And last week we left off in verse 12 where Paul realizes and has shifted his perspective that the reason why he is where he is in prison is because God wants everyone to hear the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus who took the punishment for all the wrong things that I have done. And if I put my faith and trust in him as my Savior... And, and what he accomplished on the cross, then we can have an eternal relationship with him. Not only an eternal relationship for this life, but forever. And this is God's motivation behind, behind our lives. He's not willing that anyone would perish, but that all would have eternal life. He doesn't, God doesn't want anybody to be separated from him forever. He wants everyone to hear and have the opportunity to receive the good news, the gospel, the message of who Jesus is. So Paul understands it doesn't matter where he is, whether he's free to travel around or whether he's stuck and trapped in prison, people need to hear the gospel. And so he says, how else are these prison guards going to hear the gospel unless someone that knows Jesus gets sent to prison? That's me. Paul's like, so while I'm here, I'm going to stay on mission. I'm going to keep talking about this Jesus. And every guard here, every guard in Caesar's palace has been hearing about Jesus. See, often success in navigating the low points of our life requires a shift in perspective from focusing on my circumstance to focusing on something much bigger at play that God is working on. It's a shift from focusing on what I don't like about my life to shifting focus to what God might be trying to do. See, God is always on mission, and he's inviting you to join that mission. He's inviting you to be part of it. Don't ever underestimate where God has you in this season or place of life. You may not always enjoy where you are, but God wants to use it for your good and to make himself known in this world. Some of you are thinking, look, but I don't like my job. I don't like my marriage. I don't like my neighborhood. I just, I don't like my life. And while there may not be anything wrong with you praying for a different job opportunity or or an opportunity to move somewhere else so you're not by those neighbors, maybe, just maybe, God has you where you are for a reason. He has you exactly in that house, married to that person, next to that neighbor, sitting at at that cubicle at work. Because there are people all around you that God has assigned you to to run a huge mission to tell them about who Jesus is. Some of you are like, yeah, but I don't really like the people he's assigned me to. They're kind of annoying. They kind of rub me the wrong way. They... Listen, God has this amazing and incredible way to shift hearts from dislike to love. 
to change our perspective, to reframe our perspective. I don't like where I'm at, but maybe God has me here for a reason. What is he wanting to do? Don't ever underestimate what he might be do, trying to do in and through you. God is arranging things, and he's putting people around you for you to speak to, to use the struggles that you've gone to to encourage them. In verse 15, you're like, finally, man, that was a long introduction. It is, and we're more than halfway through the message. Verse 15, Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerity, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Apparently, in the church in Philippi, there were some people that, that didn't really like Paul. They didn't like his preaching style. He was maybe a little too yelly for them. My wife told me um, for service, she's like, you were yelling kind of a lot. Like, oh, I was really excited and kind of passionate about this message. So, um, yeah, that's maybe where that comes from if you think I'm a little yelly. Uh, but he says, look, there, there, were some, there are some people. Yeah, they preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. They're kind of glad I'm in prison. And they're using me being in prison, in prison as an opportunity to kind of get their platform to teach. And he's like, you know, whatever. Other people are preaching and they're doing it out of love. Here's the thing. Paul could get really frustrated. And he could start telling the church, hey, can you get everybody in shape and, and have them stop being so mean to me? But instead he chooses a different perspective entirely. In verse 18 he says, what then? Or what does it matter, their motivation behind their teaching? Only this matters, that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And of that I rejoice. Here's the first truth that Paul has for us to reframe our perspective. The message of Jesus is not about me, it's about Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that the message of Jesus isn't about you? It's actually about him. The message of the Bible is not to tell me how great I am. The message of the Bible is not to tell me how great I can be. The message of the Bible is to point me to how great Jesus is. Amen? Like, I don't like how that feels. I thought it was about me. No, it's not about you. The message is about Jesus. And we live in a society that longs for acceptance, that longs for applause and to fit in and for fame. We see this within the church. We see it within ministry and even church leadership. We see people leaving churches because they don't like the leader. They don't like the worship. They don't like how things are done. Maybe, like me, you've heard people talk about that. You've experienced that for yourself. You've maybe even participated in it. Paul helps us reframe our perspective, and he simply says, I'm not going to judge people's motivations. Only God can see inside the deepest uh, motivations of someone's heart. And so he steps back from the division taking place and the teachers and things going on at Philippi, and he says, I I'm just going to have a different perspective. That as long as the truth of Jesus is being talked about, that's a win to me. As long as Jesus, the message of Jesus is being proclaimed, let me, let me summarize this for us. To help us reframe our perspective, what he's saying is bad motives plus the right gospel. It's okay. It's okay. We, we can work with that. I'll let God deal with the motives of someone's heart as long as the truth and the message of the gospel is being shared. Bad motives, right gospel, we can work with that. On the flip side, however, well, before I even get there, the lesson that Paul is teaching us is this. Don't bash other pastors and other leaders of churches. This is not the only great church in the area. There are lots of great churches that lift high the name of Jesus and preach the truth of the gospel. Don't bash other churches to try to make this church look better. Don't bash other leaders that might be different than how you would prefer 
but are still preaching the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ. Let God deal with those people and their hearts and their motives. Here, here's the other side of it. Bad gospel plus right motives. We got a problem. It's not good. It's not okay. Sincere, kind, but have the wrong message. We need to stand boldly against false teachings that elevate personal preference and feelings over the truth of God's word. Amen. In his letter uh, to another church in Galatia, Paul uh, points out how this ends up happening, how we start kind of drifting from the truth of the gospel into a, a different gospel. He says, for am I seeking now the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Who is it that you're living for? Whose message, what message is your life telling? Because that'll say a lot about who you're living for. When I change the message of the Bible to fit my preferences, my ideas, or my lifestyle, I've traded the truth for the acceptance of others. I've chosen my own comfort and desires to fit in over God's word to direct and shape and mold my life. And this is why we're given the warning in Romans 12.1, do not conform to the patterns of this world. Just so that you can fit in or be accepted. No, no, instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, reframe your perspective and your life on what God thinks of you, not what others think of you. This is where we start to fill that God-shaped hole in our heart. This is where Paul begins uh, to reframe our perspective in another light. And if you get this one verse that we're going to look at, Philippians 1 Verse 21, if you get this, you get the, the totality of what he's trying to communicate in chapter 1. Paul reframes his attitude in the midst of all that he's gone through physically. It's not about the circumstances, but he, he makes his focus on Christ. Before I share this passage, I want you to try to fill in the blanks. Imagine, pretend for a moment you've never seen this verse or heard this verse before. And try to fill in the blanks. For me to live is... And to die is blank. For people without a relationship with Jesus, what could they fill these blanks in with to give them the kind of hope and future that they long for? For me to live is money. And to die is to leave it all behind. Or for me to live is fame and popularity. And to die is to lose it all. Or for me to live is power, authority, and to die is to be forgotten. To die is to lose it all. To die is to leave it behind. Paul's purpose is to give hope to his readers in the relationship that transforms and fills that gap in our hearts. And so the only way you can fill in these blanks to give the kind of hope that our hearts long for is the way Paul does it. For me to live is to live for Christ and to die is to gain because I am in his presence forever. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Life had been hard. It's taken its toll on Paul. He's been imprisoned and beaten multiple times. And he's like, you know what, if God's ready to take me home, if he's ready to bring me to heaven, I I'm ready to go. But if God chooses to keep me here on earth, then I'll still be all about his mission. Speak the hope of Jesus Christ to a world that is searching and longing to find that peace that's missing inside of them. Here's the reframing lesson. Write this down. The mission of Jesus reframes the purpose of my life. The mission of Jesus reframes the purpose of my life. The message of Jesus is all about Jesus, not me. And the mission of Jesus, it reframes my perspective and my purpose for how I live. Not only is the message not about me, did you know the mission of your life is not about you? It's not about your job. It's not about your bank account, your marriage. Your, the mission of your life is not about your kids or your political view. It's not about your accomplishments. It's the mission of your life is not about your anything. Paul knew this, which is why he was able to reframe his life on God's greater mission. 
that gave him hope in the middle of the struggles of life that he faced. And that same mission can give you hope and purpose in the struggles that you are facing today. That's what reframing our our life looks like. Paul reframes his life on the mission and the message of Jesus Christ. So to live was to live for Christ's message and mission. And to die was to have accomplished that mission and be united in heaven with his creator forever. Followers of Jesus, when we die, it's not defeat, it's mission success. Now listen to Paul's encouragement for those that are in the church. Verse 27, he says, let your manner, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The NIV paraphrases or translates that. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy. The idea here is that we live in our character, in our choices, in our passions as citizens, not of earth, but as citizens of heaven. So that whether I come to see you or whether I'm absent, that I may hear. What does Paul want to hear from them? He he wants to hear uh, that their mission and that their message that they're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened by anything by their opponents. And Paul instructs the church, if you're going to live with a reframed message and a reframed mission for your life, here's how you do it. If you're going to go in the strength that God provides to share the message and to live out the mission, then you've got to reframe your life. i got to stand firm. He says, he says, stand firm. That word, stand firm, it's this military term. It means to hold the line. And what Paul says is, look, whether I'm with you or whether I'm absent, Don't let that motivate you. Don't allow circumstances in life to be your motivation for how you stand firm. Stand firm. Hold the line. In Ephesians 6, we we get this same kind of military uh, language again. He says in verse 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This charge to stand firm means that we have a real opposition that's going to try us to get us to fall down and fail. That failure is a real possibility, but that God has given us armor, the armor of God, to equip us and ready us so we can stand firm because our enemy is real. He's like a roaring lion seeking to take you out. And go back to the text. It says, uh, so how do I stand firm? Whether I'm with you, whether I'm absent, Here's here's what I want to hear about the message and the mission of your life. I want to hear you're standing firm. I want to, and, and here's how you stand firm. You stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. You stand firm by striving side by side, by by by, by not going at life alone. One of the ways we reframe our life is when we choose to do life together in unity. Around here, we say it like this. We say we are better together because we were never meant to do life on our own. So who are you striving side by side with? Who are you locking arms with? You remember that game, that that childhood game growing up? You'd grab each other's hands and you'd have a group of, a line of people over there, a line of people over here holding the line, holding the line. Red Rover, Red Rover, let come over, right? Don't break, don't break. Hold the line, hold the line. Stand side by side so that you can hold the line. Who are you holding the line with in unity for the message and the mission of Jesus Christ? It's one of the reasons that groups are so valuable in our life as followers of Jesus. And here at Heritage, we've got groups of all kinds for men and women, for married couples, and for for everybody. Because when we get together regularly and encourage one another in the message of Jesus and on mission for Jesus, we're able to hold the line a whole lot better than trying to do it on our own and in our own strength. And then he says, and don't be scared of anyone that comes against you, not the military forces of Rome or other religious teachings or the culture. You don't have to be afraid of all of that. Here's the last thing. It may be a bit harder than the first two. Hold the line Stand firm, 
side by side. And then he says, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had. And now that you hear, I still have. See, to reframe my life through Jesus' mission means that I embrace suffering. Embrace suffering. Embrace suffering. 